Just to give you a little bit of background about me and my credentials and why I'm talking to you about behavioural change through data visualisation. Um, I'm a computer scientist by background. I spent the 90s learning about or doing a variety of different technical roles to do with uh, all sorts of different computer related tasks. And the first part of the noughties I spent in various commercial and senior management roles running small uh, growing software companies. And then in 2006 decided that uh, I've had enough of making other people wealthy and I'd do it myself. It hasn't been quite that easy but uh, we're having a go. And for the past six years I have built up uh, a small growing uh, business focused on making sense of information, uh, helping people, humans, to use data. Um, and what we discovered along the way is that helping people to make better use of data has some quite interesting, fairly transformational effects on how people perform their jobs, how much fun they have in those jobs. And um, Simon picked up on a couple of points which I'm going to hopefully come back to, um, both in terms of the idea of exploration and the idea of having fun. I don't think many people here would associate data with fun, but I'm going to try and convince you otherwise. Let's see how we do. So I guess the first question really in trying to convince you that behavioural change is possible is, is why data visualisation? Why would that be something that might interest people and get them thinking about uh, different behaviours and, and actually performing different behaviours? So I want to first of all consider data. Sorry, but uh, we've got to go there in order to get to the good bits. So this for me is something that's emerged over the past three or four years particularly as we've worked with a lot of different organisations is why do people actually capture data? Um, we can track back to human history. So from, the, from time immemorial, literally time immemorial is that point at which we started recording things. So prior to that, there wasn't any data. Um, we've been recording information so that we can retrieve it, books and uh, tablets and all sorts of different means of recording things so that we can get them back. And that's fine, and that's pretty much how the world operated for uh, thousands of years until in the mid-50s, and particularly really from a business context, the late 60s, early 70s, we started doing things with computers. And really, all of the computer systems that have been put in place and have captured data have been trying to do a couple of things. To automate processes, to take activities that humans find dull, boring, tedious, and to automate them and perform them consistently. So really, most of the information that's captured in your business, uh, your organisation, or indeed by other organisations about you, is in order to automate some form of process and then to report on compliance. And I would suggest that for those of you who receive Monday morning reports and big report packs or monthly report packs that tell you all about the organisation, what it's doing and so on, they tend to be reporting on how you're complying with a raft of different processes. Maybe quite high level processes might be very detailed operational processes. But nevertheless, it's a report. It's a playback of are we doing the things that we thought we should be doing? Are we doing what we know we should be doing? Big data is uh, very much the buzzword in uh, IT circles at the moment, and it's probably touched you in your working lives. Big data is really a uh, snap phrase for just the sheer volume of information that is now captured by businesses, um, again, about you as you interact with them, but within the organisations that you work in. And smart businesses, those that are uh, making the most of that information, started to realise that they could mine that data for all sorts of interesting observations. Not just the things that they were trying to do, the processes that they knew about, but also there were other things in there that might be interesting. Um, one of the stories that's heralded in the uh, IT press or the IT world for the past 15 years is the apocryphal tale, and I'm still not sure whether it's actually true, of how a supermarket discovered that by putting beer next to nappies uh, they could sell more beer because fathers dropping in on a Friday night to pick up nappies would pick up a, uh, a four-pack of beer at the same time. That kind of observation, if it's true, is the kind of thing that emerges from data rather than is something that you're out there looking for in the first place. So analysing data, really getting involved with it, is what sets apart some of the 
big names that you know. The, the, the rise and growth of, of Facebook, of Google, of um, new media companies, of uh, Web 2.0 companies, of this next wage of digital companies is based on uh, f phenomenal analytical capability. The one that you will all have touched, I'm sure, at some point will be Tesco's club card. Tesco uh, and Dunhumby, the people behind the club card, um, started using the data that they were collecting at Till to do all sorts of interesting things, and a raft of other loyalty schemes have followed in Tesco's wake, trying to replicate what they've done. So analysing information opens up some interesting possibilities. It's not always particularly enjoyable, and a lot of that analytics is very statistical, very technical, and can be quite difficult for the analysts to communicate to the rest of us. And I'm one of the rest of us, despite being a computer scientist. I'm not an out-and-out -out statistician uh, or hardcore analyst. Um, so I need to be able to use that information, and we all need to be able to use the information, the insights that analysts can come up with in our day-to-day -day lives, and certainly in our working lives. The problem is, data is data. Data is only ever... At its very best, an accurate representation of a business it isn't the business, unless you happen to be. If anyone in the room is a data analytics business, then perhaps you're the exception. Data is a reflection of the things we do. It's a reflection of the organisation and its people, and it's people that need to access and understand that data. And I don't know how many people here do have that big 30, 40, 50, 60, 100-page management report deck does it make an awful lot of sense to you? Can you honestly say you can track through all of that stuff and understand what the organisation's doing? There are probably going to be some key performance indicators or some high-level metrics that give you a sense of we're doing well, we're doing the right things, we're not doing well, we need to change that. But do you actually understand why that's the problem? What is it that you are doing right? Why are sales up? What is it about marketing that's not working quite right? Why are people disillusioned? Getting into the data, into the detail, can often unlock that, but the challenge is how do you get into the data and the detail? So we work with an awful lot of organisations who unfortunately think the data is something magic and precious and forget that it is just a representation of what people are doing, what customers do are doing, what employees are doing, what the processes that you're trying to control are doing. And if you start to think of it as only being a representation of the business, perhaps you look at it slightly differently. So we work hard with clients and we watch organisations who analyse data well start to gain real insight about people, about product, about service, about opportunity, about, about threat, about risk through starting to look at the data in different ways. So the reporting that most organisations are very comfortable with tells us about what we know. It tells us about are we doing the things that we know with, that we should be doing correctly. Are we following those processes and are we getting the results we expect? But where does new insight come from? How do you discover that putting beer next to nappies is important? How do you decide which club card vouchers to send to which individuals? It comes from uh, a better understanding. And the person to turn to, the world authority on this, is a man called Donald Rumsfeld. Um, Donald Rumsfeld actually came up with a brilliant description of the opportunity and the challenge uh, for those who don't know, he was Bush's um, security advisor. Um, and he's famous for a quote which, in which he horribly mangled the English language, but he actually made a really valuable point, and that's why I like the quote. So he was talking about um, security issues out in Afghanistan and Iraq. I'm going to use it to talk about data and business. There are known knowns. There are things that we know we know. We know what processes we should be following. We know what behaviours we expect, and we can go and look for those. And often we'll find that we're doing them or we're not. And that's great. And that's what reporting is all about. Reporting on a business is telling you to look at what you know and to see whether you're doing it. Fantastic. We also know that there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. So I don't know uh, what each of you does for a living, but I know that you do something for a living. And so I know that. I just don't know what it is. I know what I'm looking for, which is I might come and talk to you all about what you do for a living. I know to go and ask that question. And I might be surprised by the answer. And part of analytics is that, is going and looking for things that you think, oh, I wonder if, I wonder how people are responding to this product launch. We didn't expect a problem in this area, but actually we got one. And that's quite interesting. What was the problem? That's, that's an interesting question to ask. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. Hence the mangling. 
Um, so there's a raft of stuff out there hidden in the data that's captured in systems within your organizations that's actually really rich, interesting, and fascinating. You just don't know what questions to ask. And you can't, without asking the question, how do you possibly unlock what's in the data? The answer is you have to look at the world slightly differently. You have to look at analytics. The trouble is, analytics requires economists, statisticians, computer scientists, and guys who uh, sometimes are a bit of a challenge to communicate with, um, even for me. Um, so why visualization? Well, perhaps visualization offers a means of communicating in a way that unlocks meaning and helps us understand. Quickly, where's the predator? Quick. OK, missed it, spotted it. If you haven't spotted it, you're dead. The human vision system has evolved over several million years, and it's an incredibly powerful mechanism at spotting patterns in confusing situations. And you will spot things unbelievably quickly. You don't know you can do it. It's an unknown unknown um, in information. If only that information is presented to you in a way that gives you an opportunity to use your faculty, this, this incredible visual system. Something around 75% of all of your sensory receptors are in your vision system. And that vision system isn't just your eye. It's a connection between eye and brain that is still being researched and understood. There's a huge amount of potential there to interpret information. There's also, by the way, a huge amount of potential there to misinterpret information. That's a whole other talk. I don't have time for it today. You'll spot a couple of them in these, uh, this slide here. But um, your brain, your eye-brain connection, can see things that aren't there. Can you see a sphere with spikes sticking out of it? It's not there, but you can see it. Can you see a triangle? It's not there. Okay, so your visual system has learned, has adapted, uh, partly through millions of years of evolution and partly through the training that it's given as soon as you're born, um, to find patterns in information and to fill in the gaps. Reification, similarity, we can all see the similarity between these things, even though very clearly they're different, they're still very similar. We can close shapes. There's a whole raft of... Um, psychology and thinking here and uh, academic theory behind this. I'm not going to try and go into all that today. But the, the point really is that your visual system, the entire system, not just, um, not just the eye, not just the brain, but the pairing of those two and the years of training that you've given it, allows you to detect patterns very, very quickly. And so if only we could take data and the increasingly large volumes of data that's growing pretty much exponentially still, uh, at the moment, certainly has been about the past 15, 20 years, it's been growing pretty much exponentially, uh, and put that in front of you, perhaps your visual system could make more sense of it than the numbers and even the static graphs that you tend to, to get in existing presentations today. So perhaps if we could take information, if we could make it highly visual, and particularly if we could start to interact with it, Interaction is the missing piece in all this. Interaction lets you move from being a passive reader of information where you sit in front of a report and you read it and certain things make sense. And sometimes you might see a fantastic visual, a really clear graph. Someone's put a lot of time and effort into an infographic or a, a graph that really helps you to understand a particular problem. But usually, if it's really that good, what emerges is a question. Oh, I wonder why that's happening. I wonder what it was last month that we did better than this month. I wonder what it was that... So good visuals encourage the next question. And what you need is a, an approach, a set of technologies, a set of tools, a way of thinking that encourages you to interact in real time with information, not to sit in front of a system, press a button and wait for three minutes while it calculates an answer. I think most of us wouldn't use Google if that's how Google worked. You need to be able to sit in front of a system, and as you think of ideas, you need to be able to interact with information, interact with visuals, interact with graphs, interact with maps, interact with pictures of people, interact with that information in a way that you get instant feedback. Now, if you can bring data out of the computer systems into a visual environment and make that interactive, it does become, trust me on this, it does become fun. It becomes an interesting way to explore the business performance. If we remind ourselves that the data is only a representation of the organization and its performance, if we can now take that information, bring it to life, put it in the hands of people who 
work in that organization and help them explore it, some interesting stuff starts to emerge. So how does behavior change if we do that? Um, it does, and of course, in some cases, unfortunately, it doesn't. Change, behavioral change, requires certain conditions. And in fact, uh, I think all three of the examples that Simon gave of the values drive through the businesses that <coughs> he highlighted, I would say, fall in the bottom half of this slide. So I'm using uh, a metaphor here from the geeks' uh, uh, drawer of metaphors, which is the Cathedral and the Bazaar. It's a well-known essay by uh, a software engineer from about 15 years ago. And the, the theory goes that there are two extremes of software engineering models, and I'm going to use it to say there are two extremes of data processing, data absorption, data use models. That is, uh, and clearly most organisations are somewhere along this, uh, this path. Very few sit at, both at either end. At one end, we have a very top-down, hierarchical uh, uh, organisation, a cathedral, uh, where the high priests of information guard that information jealously. They could be IT people, they could be senior execs. Information is leaked out in glimmers of uh, brilliance now and again. V people have visions, people have fantastic insights into the mystical data god, and they leak those out from time to time. And you get a little glimpse of that, but you can't really understand the whole, and you have to trust the high priest who tells you, oh, that's the way the world is. We know we're, not, we're not going to let you go off and figure that out for yourself. You're going you're gonna to have to... Uh, you're going to have to trust me on this. And organisations like that tend to have uh, information that stops as you move down through the organisation. It simply isn't fed to people lower down. And certainly the idea of passing information to people to let them explore, analyse, um, make sense of that in their own way, whoa, uh, very scary. The other side is the bazaar, where it's entirely flat. And everyone gets access to everything. And information is traded freely. And insights are traded. And people are simply passing information around and ideas around. I'm not suggesting many organisations can be that liberal with their data, but it's a spectrum. And certainly visual analytics, data visualisation, suits people at the bazaar end far more than at the cathedral end, because <clears throat> if you are jealously guarding information and only tricking it through to people, there's not a lot they can do with it visually or any other way. So I guess I'm probably now talking to maybe uh, a third of the room, hopefully two-thirds of the room, but I guess it, an awful lot depends on your organisation and organisational conditions. So we've worked with lots of different organisations, and we've had many successes and some failures, and I'm going to show a quick case study of a failure. Uh, conscious of time here, so I need to speed up a little. Um, so a top 10 global FMCG brand owner, an awful lot of our work is in retail and FMCG, fast-moving consumer goods. Um, we do work elsewhere, but there you go. Um, very hands-on interest in data visualisation, a few people in the organisation doing some interesting pioneering work with data visualisation and some local successes. We work with them on a, a significant programme to introduce visual analytics and it fell flat on its face. And it fell flat on its face because people at the centre decided how to trickle information out. They decided that they knew best and that people in the field didn't really know what they were doing and needed hand-holding and needed to be told and guided and and all that happened was we took all the old reports and turned them into pictures, and unsurprisingly, people didn't really get that. It was kind of slightly better than what they had before, but it wasn't really any kind of transformational change and certainly didn't change behaviour. Uh, unfortunately, interest withered and died. So behavioural change requires certain cultural conditions, and if your organisation is trying to empower people and push information to people and make them self-aware and make them uh, or help them become better... Um, advocates for your organisation, better understanders of your organisation, people who really get what it is you're about, then this flow of information through visual visualisation can be tremendously effective. If not, if you're in a cathedral, don't just have a market stall. Uh, should have known that one. The flip side, um, and interestingly, it's another top ten global FMCG brand owner. Uh, the conditions at first sight were identical. But culturally and behaviourally, there were some significant differences. And this was an organisation that really did want to put um, expertise and capability in the hands of people at the, uh, the coalface, people who were interacting with retailers, people who were doing the job, and gave them the responsibility of becoming the experts. In fact, most of them already were. They were already experts in a given domain. How do I deal with a retailer day by day? They needed better information, richer information, and quick assessment of that information in order to make a difference. And so visual analytics for them was transformational. 
the only thing I'd say from that whole experience, which has been resoundingly successful, is that um, best practice emerges and it needs support and nurturing and uh, effective communication. And I think um, one of the challenges for flattened business is how to get, uh, how to help people share experience and share the best of it and the worst of it because we all do good work, we all do work that's not as good and what we need to do is learn from each other. So fostering that whole um, uh, best practice kind of culture uh, unfortunately, I have to say that's beyond my capabilities, but I'm sure there are plenty of people in this room who uh, are either doing that today or certainly aspire to it. So it does require patience, collaboration, and real commitment. But it has a fantastic impact. So these are actual words used by people that we talked to at the sort of closure of the first uh, case study, the kind of um, feelings that came out from that, as opposed to the kind of feelings, uh, impressions, emotions that people felt working with information in an environment. They were trusted to do a good job, and there wasn't a set way of having to do it one way. There may be some strong guidelines. There might even be an absolute standard starting point for all investigations, all analysis, but people were trusted to get on and explore information themselves. Very quickly, conscious of time, a few actual verbatim quotes from individuals who were in merchant-style businesses, that is, organisations, bazaar-style businesses, where people were trusted to get on and do things themselves and had transformational effects on the way they worked and the results that they achieved themselves. Not how they were told to achieve them, but they were given some freedom to do it themselves and um, some fantastic um, uh, feedback emerges. So, passing thoughts. Please remember, if nothing else, data is only a representation of your organisation. It isn't the organisation. And the thing to do is find the best representations of that information to help people understand what they're doing and what impact they have on your organisations. The best way for a human is to do that visually. We all have a fantastic ability to process vision information. Reporting as you know it and love it, I'm sure, uh, addresses known patterns and behaviours, but you really need analytics in order to address the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And there are an awful lot of unknown unknowns out there, trust me on that. Finally, improved understanding. If people really get a sense of where they fit and the, how the things they have done have changed behaviours, they get really involved. And it's fun. It's great to see how your work actually has an impact. It's great to understand and come up with insights yourself rather than be told about insights. If you can actually find them yourself, that's quite an uh, enjoyable experience for most people. And ultimately, what you want is people making great decisions. In an increasingly federated world, in an increasingly connected world, it, where every employee is increasingly an advocate and a representative of your business, you want them making great decisions. And to do that, you need to give them great understanding. Thank you very much.